going to keep it brief. I'm going to introduce uh, my good friend and an incredible supporter for many, many years. My Freedom International is now 26 years old. We're over by the train station. My wife, my wonderful wife, Deborah, is a boy. <laughs> Uh, but my freedom is 26 years old. We're all over the world. And about uh, let's see, I, I, about let's see. And when, how many years ago was it you got active with my freedom, Celia? Uh, I believe 20 years. Yeah, about 20 years ago, and then 10 years ago, Celia became a, about a board president, and is as as a leader in the field of consumer survivor activities. Celia will tell you her story, and she's one of the leaders in the having recipient affairs, having psychiatric survivors do peer support and take leadership, and she's, she's done this in New York for many years. But more than that, she's also worked on this internationally. Celia headed up the Mind Freedom team in the United Nations, which is conveniently located in New York City. So we have a, not a NGO status with the UN, so Celia led a team that went in there for five years with disability advocates all over the world and helped win a treaty called the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which you can Google, United Nations CRPD. It's like an ADA for the world, an incredible achievement. And Celia was part of that building relationships with the so-called physical or sensory disability groups from all over the world. I had the privilege of going to Ghana with Celia and working with her in, with Mind Freedom Ghana to help support the voice of people in poor developing countries. So I could go through a long list, but for me the key thing that Celia brings to this social change movement is combining the power of mutual support with the power of activism. Uh, Celia's warmth and love and her outreach to so many people in so many different capacities uh, is just an incredible uplift to this whole social change movement and to my work in Mind Freedom International and to so many other groups in our movement. So a big round of applause for Celia Brown from New York City. exciting to be here. I'm finally in Eugene um, uh, with David, with Deborah, with Jackie. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about um, my story. I was um, in, uh, in the psychiatric institution at about 16 years old. I was uh, sexually abused. Uh, then they didn't have the, the language of trauma that they do now. And um, so, you know, so I was in and out of the hospital for a while. And one of the things that bothered me, but was never, was, wasn't addressed when I got there when I was 16, is what happened to me. And no one thought to ask me, you know, what happened that, you know, you were sexually abused or anything. I was just put on so many psychiatric drugs um, and I, I was bothered by that because I really needed to heal and needed someone to uh, be supportive and work through those issues. It wasn't until I got to a state hospital, I was in a county hospital at the time, um, that I worked with a resident uh, doctor who I told my story to and she was fascinated about it. And she, from from me telling, sharing my story and healing and working it out, um, she um, decided to do to do research. And I can't say who she is, but um, you know, it's confidentiality, um, and she would want me to talk about it. But she does research on um, uh, childhood uh, sexual abuse and uh, for children and adults in the mental health system uh, based on me working with her. So, you know, I, at the time, I think we were learning from each other. You know, I was trying to heal, and she was doing her residency, and so she learned from me, and I hope that was a good, good combination. Um, so in the, at that time, this is in the late, uh, in the early 80s, 
1980s. Um, my doctor, which I was upset about, said to my mom that, because my mo mother wanted to take me home, and at that time there was no housing, there was no group homes or anything like that. Um, so she recommended that I stay here until I got housing in the community, so I did that. Um, and, you know, after a while, because, you know, I really wanted to get out. I never really wanted to be in the locked up in the hospital. I wanted to be in the community. I wanted to be just like everyone else. And um, so it was, a, you know, it was a learning experience for me to be in um, supported housing. But one of the things that happened um, is that they considered me to be high functioning, which I, I don't like the phrase, but um, that's what they thought of me. And they uh, sponsored me to go to a conference called Self-Help Vision in Albany, well, Troy, New York, which is next to Albany. And I go there, and I meet uh, um, activists like Sally Zinman, and Howie T. Harp, and Ed Knight, um, and Judy Chamberlain. And I remember going up to them and I said to Judy, I said, who's allowing you to do these alternatives <laughs> and talk about rights? I just couldn't believe that that was happening. Because I was coming from, still in the community, but in housing, but it was like a mini institution, where my, you know, my rights weren't really being discussed. I was just doing whatever it is that, that uh, they asked me to do as a condition to live in the housing program. So I got, that changed my whole entire life. So when I got back from this two-day conference, I formed a support group with the uh, residents. And we were just sharing feelings and talking about things we didn't like about the staff, what we didn't like about the housing. And eventually that ended. <laughs> they didn't allow that to happen. But we, you know, I continued with like three or four of my friends that lived in housing and we used to, you know, meet out in the community and just continued the support group. And at that time, there was a, a book called Reaching a Course that Sally Zimmerman and Subud and Howard T. Harp wrote. And it was all about how to develop your own self-help group, your drop-in center, how to fundraise, all of these different things. And that sort of was um, a manual for me to continue doing what I was doing. And I was doing this in the Bronx. I'm from the Bronx, New York. And so this helped me to get uh, in the consumer survivor expatriation movement. Um, so I was always interested in rights. I was always interested in being free because I wanted really to free my mind and learn more about who I was, and not just um, using um, psychiatric drugs in order for me to heal. And for me, um, the diagnosis that I had at the time um, was, um, you know, it, it, it was disempowering for me. It, for me, it meant that I'm the disease and I'm not ciliary. I'm not someone's daughter, I'm not someone's sister, who am I? So I did everything that I could to read up on it. Um, at the time it was manic depressive, later bipolar. So that I could see, you know, carve out my own identity of who I am. And this is really important for me. So I consider myself a psychiatric survivor, a trauma survivor. Um, I'm a, a mother now, I have a 16-year-old son, and uh, when, I just want to, you know, say that when I was in the hospital, the messages they gave me is that I would never amount to anything, I wouldn't be able to go to work, I can't go to school, I certainly wouldn't be able to have my own family, and now I proved them wrong, I can have that, and I do, and so uh, that's the reality of my life, and um, so, you know, I, I really thank my mom and my family. My mother was really my advocate throughout this before I even knew about the movement. And she helped me 
she believed in me and she supported me and she advocated for me when I was in the hospital and that really was very, very important for me. As well as being a part of the movement um, itself. Um, like David was saying with alternatives, alterna does everyone know about alternatives, the conference? Who knows Heard about the alternatives <laughs> conference? The one, yeah, the one we were talking about. So a few, maybe a fourth. Well, um, this, uh, this, um, the Alternatives Conference is a conference for and by people uh, who are consumers and survivors and ex-patients. And now, uh, it's a whole history of it, but I, I won't go into it totally, but uh, the federal government sponsors this conference <coughs> every year at a different location. And this year it happened to be in Portland, Oregon. And I love the conferences. I get to see so many people. I get to reconnect with Jackie and David and all, all people around the country. And I like to call that peer support. So it's really good to reconnect and connect with people. But it's a conference where uh, uh, consumers and survivors and peers do uh, workshops um, and about things that they're doing, like peer run services or trauma, uh, things that they have learned or are working on that they want to share with everyone. So it's 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 uh, really one of the best conferences I think that I go to. That really is just about us, just really really about <coughs> us. Um, in addition to working with Mind Freedom. Um, I, I work as a regional advocacy specialist and for the Office of Mental Health. And um, I really try to bring all the issues and values of recovery and wellness to people who are still inside um, the, the psychiatric hospitals, which I, I believe are my brothers and sisters. And I, uh, they call, they, that they have, they wanted to have resources about employment or training. How can they become a peer specialist? Um, some, sometimes it's about complaints of programs, housing programs, or programs they're in. And I like a, a problem solver. Like I, I work on developing strategies to 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 support them. So I do that, and I also. Um, advise uh, people in my office about recovery and wellness so that they don't forget who they're working for and they're really working for us basically you know uh, so that's what I what I do uh, but I've been involved with Mind Freedom International and it's also been very healing for me to, to work um, around mutual support um, and um, you know, just to be a part of other people who are like-minded, who are really fighting for human rights and support, I think, uh, is important for me. Um, so I've been in the movement, um, I don't know, 20, 25 years or so, and, and I'm happy to be here. And I've watched it change, you know. I've, um, I've learned from people the shoulders that I, that, um, I stand on. And you know, I consider myself someone who can share that knowledge with new people that are coming into the movement. I think I think history is really important. Um, so I, like David was saying, I worked at um, I worked voluntarily at the United Nations on a treaty called the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and I also worked with World Network of Using Survivors of Psychiatry. And there were so many other disability groups. You know, there were the, the World Blind Union, um, the um, uh, Deaf Federation. I mean, there were so many different disability groups fighting for their rights. And it took us, I mean, maybe two years of that five-year time to really educate them about what our issues were. That we have rights, and. Um, you know, because they've heard all different kinds of stories of people with a mental illness, um, you know, can't think for themselves, can't make decisions for themselves, 
but they can, and I know that we can, because I'm sitting here, that is sitting here, David, you know. So um, I, I really think working there, we really developed, um, we really developed the whole convention, because I could cite any article in there. And, and one of the things that was really important was legal capacity, because people with a mental illness really don't have any rights um, and we wanted, we wanted to make sure that people that uh, have a mental illness and have other disabilities have a right to vote, you know, ha have a right to be whoever they want to be. And um, so that, that's Article 12 um, in the convention. And later I'll give you the, the website um, that you can go on. But the whole thing about this was really grassroots organizing inside of the UN and working with different groups and working with government delegates to really let them know that um, you know nothing about us without us. We are going to be here the, all this, every step of the way. So we were looking at um, drafts of articles, sitting through a lot of meetings, and, you know, and really being there because. This is like really historical as well, that this is something that was done by all of us. Um, so it's been, it was adopted in March of 2006 and they had a whole ceremony which I attended at the United Nations. And it, it's just been a milestone. I'm just really, really proud of it. Now, um, you know, we've been doing a lot of education um, around what is the treaty, because it can be very complicated, um, but also figuring out ways on how we can implement it in different countries. And one of the places I've been working with is Ghana and in West Africa with Mind Freedom Ghana, as David mentioned, we went there together, uh, to really figure out, work with them, because the culture is very different. And um, people are not just going to just jump up and say, well, you know, now we have rights and everyone's going to change. So we have to really work closely with everyone. Um, uh, I, um, um, our, our fellow user survivors, we have to work with, you know, mental health professionals and all of this. We have to do a lot of education around uh, the convention and about human rights. Um, the other thing I really believe in is alternatives, um, healing alternatives. And the system, the mental health system hasn't really provided alternatives for people. So we um, I work with Mind Freedom and other groups on, um, we have a Hearing Voices Network. Has anybody ever heard of it? Yeah. Great. Um, where people who hear voices, see visions, different thoughts, can really support each other and feel comfortable in having that, in having uh, voices. Um, in New York City, um, we had a training at Daniel Hazen, who's an activist in New York, and the founder of it, Ron Coleman from uh, Europe, came in and did this whole uh, two-day training with uh, you know consumers and survivors from New York City, and one of the conditions we have for the training is they can't just be trained; they have to go out and develop a support group because uh, we have many trainings and people take trainings, but nothing's implemented. And in New York City, we we have some peer programs, we don't have enough. So now we have five support groups. We have groups that are running in in um, community mental health programs. We have support groups that are in the library, similar to this, that they need. We have a listserv so people can support each other as they're facilitating. So I'm really, really proud of that. I think that that's you know, a milestone for New York City anyway. Um, so I think you know any alternative is, is good. I mean, holistic healing, yoga, I'm a Reiki um, two practitioner, and that's really helped me in my recovery. So, I mean, everybody's um, journey in recovery is different. Just for me, I feel like uh, I need something spiritual and healing for myself. And, and then that, and that helps me. Um, so I'm going to stop right there.
and let um, and, and have my co-presenter speak. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Susan.